Egan, Plotsky and Sanderson Professional Association Auditors, 2016 Annual Financial Report Audit. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Either way, you can sit there. There's a microphone there also okay. at the table. Okay. Thank you very Whatever much. Whatever you're most comfortable with. Um, good evening, everyone. Again, I'm Scott Egan with your audit firm, Plotsky and Sanderson out of Concord, New Hampshire. Um, here to present your 2016 audit. I wanted to run over uh, your opinion, a couple of the budgetary highlights, a few points in the report, and then I would like to open it up to you to answer any questions, and customarily I know the board has had you know, several <laughs> questions, so I'll let you direct me as to the information you want to hear. Um, I do want to point your attention to page one of the audit report and just spend a few minutes going over your opinion. Um, this is a very important part of the audit here. I just want to explain a little bit about the opinion letter and what it's telling you here. Um, your first paragraph, we're just, again, letting you know what we're auditing, the accompanying financial statements of the governmental activities, each major fund, and the aggregate remaining fund of the town as of and for the year ended December 31st, 2016, and the related notes which collectively comprise this report. Um, management is responsible for the preparation and fair presentation of the numbers in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. And our responsibility as auditors is to express an opinion on the financial statements based upon our audit, which we conducted uh, in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards uh, in order to obtain reasonable assurance about whether the financial statements are free from material misstatement. Um, this year, uh, you have received an unmodified opinion on all opinion units. That's a clean opinion or what you're looking for. Um, and I'll just read that paragraph for you. In our opinion, the financial statements referred to above present fairly in all material specs the respective financial position of the governmental activities, each major fund, and aggregate remaining fund information of the town of Hampton as of December 31st, 2016. Um, again, this indicates that there were no material misstatements identified in the audit and you are current with all applicable governmental accounting standards as of this time, which has allowed you to have an unmodified opinion, which is what you are really shooting for. Um, at this point, what I wanted to do was go to the back of the report and go over a little bit of the budgetary information and talk about the change in your unassigned fund balance for the year. Um, just to give you a brief summary of the financial operations for the year. Um, the budgetary information, uh, the detailed budgetary information begins on page 42 of your audit reports um, and it's labeled Schedule 1 and this is the essentially budget versus actual report, uh, the budgetary results of your general fund. Uh, the total budgetary um, estimated budget was $28,621,000. Um, included in that was $1,005,000 uh, intended to reduce the tax rate. So that was a plan decrease in your fund balance. Um, you actually, um, excluding that item, had a, a positive uh, variance or a, a revenue surplus of $900,000. Um, mainly led to some additional tax revenue and increased motor vehicle revenues, uh, which allowed you uh, to end on a positive basis for your revenue. Um, Schedule 2 details your expenditures for the year. And um, again, if you look at the uh, end of this, most of the departmental budgets um, were fairly close given the size of your community and the overall budget resulting um, in an unexpended balance of your appropriations of about $716,000. Um, so again, on the $28 million, that's a relatively close number um, or a realistic budget that was adopted and the spending was um, in whole in line with what was budgeted. Um, on page 45, Schedule 3, this just gives you a quick summary of, of the changes in fund balance that you received of your unassigned fund balance. Uh, you began the year with $6,991,000 in unassigned fund balance. Again, we discussed that million dollars, which was uh, your part of your prior year fund balance that you reduced as a re that you used as a revenue offset to reduce the amount of taxes that you raised. Uh, you had a revenue surplus of $900,000 an unexpended balance of your appropriations is $716,000, which added back $1.6 million to your 
unassigned fund balance. Uh, there were some changes in your other claims on fund balance, other restrictions. There was an increase in non-spendable fund balance. Um, those are just required designations of your fund balance if you have non-spendable items, mostly usually prepaid items that are not in cash form that, that create a claim on your fund balance and an increase in uh, an assigned fund balance and an abatement for a contingency. Again, another increase in a, in a claim on that unassigned fund balance, which uh, ended you at $7,136,000 for the year. Um, again, there was a planned decrease, if you will, at all else equal, you would have decreased that number by a million dollars, but as a result of a combination of uh, a budgetary savings and a favorable revenue amount, uh, you actually increased your unassigned fund balance slightly for the year. Uh, and again, that's all in line, um, you know, within your minimum fund balance uh, that as a board you, you try and shoot for each year, and that was evaluated as part of the audit. Um, just to bring you back now, um, again, that's probably some of the, the most significant information, but I want to bring you to page nine, um, your statement in net position. This is the, the government-wide or the combining balance sheet for the town. Um, it lists all your assets and liabilities, long-term assets, capital assets, and uh, liabilities. Uh, a lot of things in here are in line with prior years. I just want to point your attention again to the long-term liabilities and just um, go over one point. Um, the long-term liabilities are comprised of several items, um, some of which are traditional borrowings that you may be used to. Others relate to pension liabilities, other post-employment benefits that really are amounts that are required to be reported on your financial statements, but there is a they're a result of you belonging to the New Hampshire retirement system and it's your proportionate share of the retirement system liability. And I just want to point that note out to the board um, so you can review that. And um, that'll be located um, on page 29, your long-term liability note. You'll see uh, the total long-term liability uh, is 44846000 of that. Uh, 23538000 relates to this net pension liability, whereas the traditional bonds payable that you have as a community would only total 19566000 So this is a variable component of your audit report each year is depending on the pension liability that results in uh, from the retirement system, that gets passed on to you and may go up or down in a given year, not because of payments. It's not a funding issue from the town. It's really just your proportionate share of, of whether or not that plan is funded or underfunded. And um, you know, this year, there was a $1.8 million increase in your net pension liability, not again due to what the town was doing, but due to some changes in actuarial assumptions, which decreased the funding percentage of the plan, which gets passed down to all the um, pension plan members. Um, and finally, I just wanted to go over um, your governmental funds balance sheet and activity. Um, this is going to give you a breakdown of the individual funds, um, your general fund, your permanent fund, the real estate trust, and your other governmental funds, which are going to be highlighted um, individually in the back of your report, uh, beginning on, let's see here, I believe it's going to be page 46, uh, but that collectively will give you the individual fund basis um, results of each uh, major fund, which again, you have two, which would be your general fund, your permanent fund, the real estate trusts, um, and then all other fund information. But um, across the board for the other funds, your real estate trust um, ended with uh, total fund balances of $20,207,000. Um, and that is going to be an increase in fund balance of about $2.3 million over last year, largely due to favorable investment performance. Um, your other governmental funds uh, ended with, again, total fund balances of $1,139,000. Uh, that was an increase in 
uh, fund balance of $110,000 from prior year, and the detail of the individual fund results will be found at the end of the audit report. Um, at this point, I wanted to open it up to answer any questions that you may have on this report or have any other questions that you may have for me. Regina? Um, yeah, you pointed out on the uh, long-term liabilities that actually most of that amount is comes from the uh, net pension liability. Correct. Which up until a few years ago we weren't even recognizing, is that correct? Exactly. There was a reporting change. It was GASB statement number 68 and essentially prior to this accounting pronouncement, it was a cash basis accounting for your retirement where you just reported your contributions that you made to the system and there was no related liability. Um, this happened globally to all governments that they changed essentially to an accrual basis where now um, the plans always calculated whether they were funded or underfunded but in a in a group plan like you belong to in the New Hampshire retirement system um, what they determined was that that liability needs to be proportionately reported by each individual member it isn't your actual liability if you wanted to actually exit the, the retirement system it's not a hard fast number it's an actuarial estimate um, and the note related to that will show you just kind of how volatile that number can be um, in the detailed retirement note it shows you if you change the assumed rate of return on the investments one percent up or down there's going to be a significant fluctuation in that but that is something that um, came on well, two years ago now um, and has you know dramatically impacted all government financial statements um, and again the larger the community the higher uh, number of personnel you have payroll that you're paying the larger that liability is as a percentage of your your overall um, liabilities and on that note next year they're going to be doing something similar to your other post-employment benefits um, right now there is a other post-employment benefit liability which compared to this is again relatively small uh, what they're doing is they're changing <laughs> they're changing that and there is going to be a other post-employment benefit liability related to New Hampshire retirement system and the medical subsidy that is um, going to be reported it's going to be much smaller than the pension numbers when the pension numbers came out it was somewhere around 4.8 billion that they were splitting up amongst everyone in New Hampshire um, and I believe that the ballpark on the last I looked at the audit report was somewhere around 700 million is the medical subsidy percentage that again is going to be split up on a kind of pro rata share a, a contribution based share to um, each of the local government state everyone who participates in the New Hampshire retirement system but again that's going to be a much smaller number and because of changes to New Hampshire retirement and the medical subsidy program that'll be decreasing each year uh, in theory so um, those are something to be aware of that there's going to be a change to your OPEB um, that's going to be coming through and, and we'll highlight that in in next year's audit when when that change happens to give a little bit of emphasis to that but again it's another one of these uh, liabilities that is essentially passed down to you for lack of a better way to put it um, you're still going to have a in addition to the medical subsidy you still have your other OPEB piece they're going to change the way that that number gets calculated as well um, and they're streamlining some of the assumptions and that that number is going to go up um, nothing has changed in reality of the plans or the benefits you're providing but the accounting standards are, are changing the way that you must account for it and uh, some of the assumptions that the actuaries are allowed to use to come up with that estimate mm -hmm. um, so that'll be something coming down the line uh, for next year but as far as your job as an auditor your job is to come in and make sure that financial statements are properly stated there is no over understatement of assets or, finance or liabilities Exactly. And that's what all these updates to recent accounting pronouncements that have exactly. been adopted and implemented by our finance director have done. Exactly. That, that these numbers are true in accordance with the current standards. So, um, you know, one year there was $23 million less on your balance sheet, but under the accounting rules, that was correct. Um, and then when that change occurred, we made sure that that was implemented correctly and that the proper balances and and changes to the pension expense were reflected in here as well as the notes to the financial statements that these are complete and accurate um, as of the you know the, the standards in force as of the financial statement date. 
Thank you very much. I'll say thank you. That's it. So what did you say the uh, the amount is estimated for the uh, retirement? The other post-employment, the next year's yeah. amount, the other post-employment benefits. The medical subsidy, I believe the, the total amount, um, and I haven't looked at it in a while, but I believe was around $700 million. And again, that's to be split up amongst all members yeah. of the New Hampshire retirement system. Half of that goes to the state, and then it gets proportionately shared. Um, and how much for the other one, though? The uh, uh, is there another charge for the re the actual retirement or uh, the pension? Yeah, pension. the pension piece was in that note was the twenty three million. Um, that's your percentage share of the total um, net pension liability of the New Hampshire retirement system. Okay, thank you. Bill? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you, Scott, for coming in. Uh, I really like the work that you've done uh, and you've transitioned with our, our finance director. And uh, um, over my six years at, uh, at this post and uh, reviewing this every year, uh, this is the tightest report I've seen. Would you agree with that? Yes. Yeah, it, 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 there really is uh, a quantum difference in uh, the reporting, uh, the compliance, uh, in the numbers and in how it presents itself. So thank you for, for leading us in, in those uh, federal compliances under government accounting standard rules. Uh, I know that you did some of those uh, out of hide uh, for the town. Uh, our director, um, newly tenured, but a long tenured at this department, has done a magnificent job. Uh, Mr. Welch over here uh, has done a magnificent job. And <clears throat> in the totality, as you look at this, uh, audit and it, it gets me really excited uh, to review this and I've got myriad questions for you uh, to orient the public to just how great it looks and to speak of some of the challenges um, it uh, it really is an extraordinary corporation of first responders it is an extraordinary corporation of uh, citizens and taxpayers uh, and uh, a really really remarkable government platform and it uh, certainly has to be one of the finest corporations if not the finest in this town uh, and, and certainly, as we look to uh, um, state governments, other governments that fail, uh, international governments that fail, um, Mr. Welch, uh, my fellow board members, and, and those that have contributed to it to include finance and you guys have done an exceptional job. I will say that um, before I get into my details, uh, as you look at these uh, pension liabilities, um, there's some wiggle room in those, but those will be paid by this town. And uh, those are liabilities. Mm -hmm. And you look at the extraordinary cost to include health insurance in these pensions, and it's tens and tens and tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars of liabilities. And those will be paid. And there is wiggle room, and we'll discuss a little bit of that. Uh, and then when you look at this effort of the state that used to fund a portion of that, am I correct, Mr. Bridal? And what happened to their effort on that? Did it vanish? It dried up. It dried up. And so those that would uh, say that we uh, do not continue to, continue to clamor uh, and legislate and uh, uh, execute torts uh, to secure reimbursement for our substantial, substantial investment on state properties, uh, you're not looking at this audit the right way. Um, you probably can't run a business. Uh, and if you do, you're going to be out of business because uh, these are extraordinary, extraordinary responsibilities that until the director um, incorporated these compliances and there were modified statements by you about these, these true costs weren't, weren't available. And when you do, you do put them together on top of salary, on top of health insurance costs, on top of these pension costs, it is extremely, extremely expensive to put somebody on another business platform that they don't pay for and you don't get paid back for. It's unfair to the taxpayers, and this is more dramatic uh, evidence of our need to exploit those uh, pursuits that we are, that Mr. Giraldis, this is board, has voted on, um, and uh, it is a very righteous and just economic right that we do that. So thank you for that. I had fun enjoying uh, the time that I did spend reviewing this, and again, thank you for your work. Explain to the uh, folks uh, the net position in this town, please. Sure. The, uh, what, what that concept means and uh, our net position. And, sure. Uh, 
how good that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your total net position is uh, 44894000 and that can be found on page 9 of the audit report. Uh, that's essentially the residual value. Um, after you've um, taken away all the liabilities, deferred inflows, um, other commitments, subtracted <coughs> them from your assets, it's the residual amount. Um, it help, it's helpful for a lot of people to kind of consider this your net worth. Um, it's a concept that translates for people. Um, and typically, um, there are a couple of things to, to point out in here. Uh, the largest component of your net position is the net investment of capital assets. So that's the value of all your capital assets, less any related borrowings that were used to acquire those assets. So um, your, your infrastructure, your buildings, et cetera, um, that contributes essentially or makes up 28 million uh, of your net position. Um, other restricted amounts, uh, a lot of that is your trust fund, your permanent trust fund money. Um, that's $20 million. The deficit, the unrestricted deficit of $4.1 million, that's the residual, what's left over. And again, uh, that's mainly that way because of that pension liability. Um, and, um, you know, if you look at it, this is looking at all of that. But again, that's a, essentially a unfunded liability that has come onto your books, which has decreased that. But in, in total, it shows a, a net position. Uh, a positive net position of forty-four million eight hundred ninety-four thousand. Wonderful, thank you. On page three of your report, you say it's a useful indicator of whether the financial condition of the town of Hampton is improving or deteriorating. Based on uh, your statements and our net position and your audit, uh, please comment on whether our net position uh, is improving or deteriorating. Sure, sure. And I'll, I'll just want to clarify, that is part of actually Christie's part, the management's discussion analysis, but I would concur with that statement. Um, and again, if we if we take a look at the <coughs> various components of this, um, page ten, change in net position, um, you'll see a, a positive increase of eight million six hundred eighty nine thousand dollars. That would be the number that I would look at, showing that again it's increasing. There are a lot of components that go into that number, um, but that would be um, you know the true reflection of, of the direction that the net position is heading. Thank you, um, Gatsby thirty four. Uh, the government-wide government -wide statement of net position. Yes. Um, on page four, and we'll get into some more details. I've got uh, 15 or 20 more questions for you. This is very important stuff. Um, the depreciation expense. Uh, explain that in general terms of the uh, several million dollars a year that uh, that expense line is running, and what are the implications uh, for um, preservation and reconstruction of those assets? Sure. So. Um I'd have to take one step back from that question just to give everyone a little bit of an explanation. Um, your audit report has three bases of accounting. You have a budgetary basis, um, which is how all your state forms are reported, and that budgetary basis is concerned with compliance with the budgets and, uh, and amounts voted for each department each year, and annual appropriations, encumbrances, uh, remaining budget balances of each line. Um, and Again, that's kind of a budgetary spending and what you report each year to get your unassigned fund balance. There are, there's a modified accrual basis which has some different requirements um, of what's deemed an expenditure than your budgetary basis. The budgetary basis, um, again, it has some state nuances. Um, but the bottom line on both of those is that you budget them out for um, a building and, and the outlay for the building is is charged against the budget in the year that it was budgeted. Um, when you look at depreciation expense and, and expenses on your government-wide statements, uh, what happens is those major buildings improvements are, are capitalized and um, as opposed to the budgetary basis where everything is expensed in the year that the item was budgeted for and paid for, um, it's matching the expense with the portion of a, a useful life of that asset. So um, it's kind of an indication that depreciation expense of the, if you want to think of it, of the annual operating costs of your long-term assets. And that's really what that number represents and, and kind of shows you, again, there's a, a budgetary focus, but from an operational standpoint, it gives you a little bit of a different view of what's required to run the town. 
Thank you. And an example perhaps would be uh, uh, we have the uh, junior high school hasn't had changes in 40, 50 years. They were just uh, a $24 million um, reconstruction project, 24, 25, whatever it was. Um, but that would be incorporated in that depreciation. The asset is actually deteriorating, and then you've got to commit resources back in to raise that capital Correct. limit back up again. And then, of course, it'll depreciate again. Correct. And then we've got that problem with our sewer system, and uh, um, that's going to be uh, something we'll talk about in a bit, but the same principle. We don't spend any money on it for 40 or 50 years, and then boom, it's time to pay up. Uh, thank you. Uh, deferred outflows on page, uh, deferred outflows of resources. In 2016, it was 6.7 million. In 2015, it was 1.4. Can you just generally speak to that 5 million, 5 point something million dollar swing? Um, that is going to mainly, um, I'd have to look at the report here, but that's going to mainly relate to changes in pension variables. Um, that's typically your deferred inflows and deferred outflows. Uh, the, the main contributors to that are changes in the pension liability. Um, those are, are essentially <coughs> increases. Um, it, it's like an, a, a deferred outflow is, it, it, it's not really an asset because it's in, it's essentially it's an increase in an asset, if you will, that relates to a future reporting period, and most of these things relate to pension amounts. Thank you. Uh, budgetary revenues, Exhibit A, um, the actual budgetary revenues exceeded the budget estimate by uh, $0.8 million. That's a good thing. Yes. Yeah. Um, you want to be on that side. Yeah, we do. Uh, page number seven, the, the, again, the net capital assets. Um, you've got land, construction and progress, buildings and improvements, machinery, equipments and vehicles, uh, infrastructure. Uh, the infrastructure, infrastructure is at uh, 50 million. Uh, vehicles, uh, 13 million. Equipment included uh, buildings and improvements. So those are substantial uh, depreciation uh, expenses and challenges for a municipality, are they not? Yeah, absolutely. Got it. Okay. Um, our bonded debt limit. Tell me uh, what you think about that in terms of uh, statutory uh, under NH, uh, the RSA 33.4 and uh, where we're at and in terms of percentage, 20%, 26. Please uh, expound on that. Um, sure. I, I mean, I think relative, um, relative to your size, uh, you're, you're not up against your debt limit. You're well below it. Um, and each community has varying levels of debt depending on how they uh, fund their infrastructure and the, and the size. A town like Hampton has, has a lot to maintain, um, has a lot of um, infrastructure and public improvements that need to be maintained. So relative to the services you're providing, I would say it's a, it's a reasonable amount of debt and well below your limit. Um, and the uh, allowable debt calculation is based on total valuation, is it not? Yes. Okay. And so we've got a community that is perhaps a, an upper middle class community. Uh, there's other uh, communities that don't have uh, some of these uh, economic engines and these, uh, these uh, valuations uh, that uh, border us. And so while the valuations are high, uh, the average taxpayer when they're confronted with percentages and they could increase that, it still has to be paid by someone with an, a pocketbook or a wallet, correct? Right. So expound on that, for, uh, for folks, please. The, yeah. I, there's I, a dichotomy there that doesn't translate well to uh, reality. Sure. I mean, I, it, you're not going to want, you're, you're at about 20% of your, your bonded debt limit, but the, the end result of all this is that uh, each year, uh, those debt payments are going to be budgeted. They're going to be a fixed part of your budget. You're going to know what they are. Uh, so when you increase your, your debt limit by $10 million, that's a real payment that needs to be paid for and budgeted each year, and you don't have any wiggle room or way to reduce it. You're going to be committed for whatever that borrowing term is, and it's going to have a noticeable impact on the tax rate. So it's managing... Um, how you do that, when is the right time to borrow, what's the right amount to borrow, um, and you know what's the right amount of surplus to set aside to reduce borrowings in the future, things like that, that all communities face. Um, and it's it's nuanced in every every community, but that's kind of the long-term capital planning that, that boards have to deal with. 
Got it. Thank you. And again, we, we talked about it briefly, but uh, a deferred outlaws, outflows of resources, again, related to pensions. Again, the state walked away from that. Uh, page number nine, $6.6 .6 million. I don't need any comment. Uh, on page number 10, um, motor vehicle permit fees. Our, our town clerk runs that department. That is uh, a three point, uh, well, what, what is that for? Um, $3.4 million business down there. Correct. They're doing uh, $14,000 a day in revenue. Uh, they run it with four or five people. It's one of the biggest businesses in town. Your comments on uh, that, please? Uh, it's a very well-run department. Um, very professional. We haven't had any issues down there. Um, and again, uh, the, the motor vehicle trends um, statewide with the economy, we've seen a lot of communities surpass their budget, but from a, a collection and control standpoint, we haven't you know, identified any issues within that office. Wonderful. Thank you for that. It, it, it is a great business. And it's a very well-run department, and it is not subject to those uh, depreciation factors, uh, huge personnel costs, and uh, boy, it is a real force multiplier for our bottom line. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, on uh, page number 11, uh, and, and, uh, voluntary tax liens, tax deeded property subject to sale, um, total amount of that looks to me about $100,000. Is that correct? Um, yes, you're, you're at about 68, 69,000. And that is people that have not, uh, cannot, uh, and, and do not pay their, their tax bills, correct? That is correct. And um, the, the reserved until collected, we don't count that as part of your fund balance since it's not really available. So that's why you have that contra amount on there. So that doesn't flow into the bottom line fund balances that you see there. But it's accounted for and transparent there. Got it. Uh, and then further on down that, that schedule on page 11, unavailable revenue. And I know this is year end last year. However, uh, it's $0.8 million for unavailable revenue property taxes. Mm -hmm. Just expound on that, please. Sure. Um, <clears throat> your property tax revenue, um, for this statement, there is a, a revenue recognition criteria. Essentially, it's the funds must have been received within 60 days of year end to be considered revenue and amounts that you know are yet to be will be received or will receive 60 days after year end. They are um, deferred on this statement. Just again, um, this statement has what they call a current uh, financial resources uh, focus. So they want the funds to actually have been received in cash soon enough after year-end to actually liquidate year-end bills, so it's mm -hmm. a little bit more restrictive reg revenue recognition criteria. So that is essentially tax revenue that came in March or later. Got it. And, the, and, the, and that 800000 is that a multi-year, that $0.8 million, is that a multi-year before a lien goes on it? Is that what that is, or is that um, is that within the calendar year? That's within that? the that's within the calendar year. That's of your of your revenue that we're reporting. That's the amount that came in more than sixty days after year end. Got it. And that's earning uh, twelve percent, correct? Correct. Okay, got you. Um, uh, the unassigned fund balance uh, speaks for itself. I think that's an extraordinary uh, job by uh, leadership in this town, by the taxpayers, by the citizens, and Mr. Welch in finance. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, the capital assets, you've got a schedule varying on whether it's land or property or equipment. You've got a schedule for depreciation. Uh, on page 12, you're talking uh, we're starting out at $97 million, uh, for your assessment of those and that it's dropped uh, down to 50 uh, just under $50 million, correct? Correct. This is one of the, the schedules here that you're looking at on page 12. Um, because there's three different rules, essentially, that we're preparing the statements with, each of them has a reconciliation to it. Yes, the other, and you're correct in that. That 97 million—that's your historical cost, the purchase price of essentially mm -hmm. those assets, and the accumulated depreciation of almost 50 million brings the the net value down to 48 million. Got it. Uh, Long-term liabilities again. We've got the bonds uh, that we do uh, for for our capital and our infrastructure, and, and importantly, again, I say uh, our net pension liability. Uh, exceeds, uh, and there is wiggle room, but I, I would say that it still exceeds our uh, bonded uh, um, obligations, um, and uh, certainly it's 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 no less. There isn't a 20, 25 percent wiggle room in that, and it's $23 million. And again, that's the cost of, of government, and it's extraordinary. And under general government in our expenditures, uh, which is $8.6 million, uh, a substantial portion of that, millions and millions of dollars, is our health insurance. So that's uh, that's quite a bit. Um, in terms of uncompensated f um, uh, 
fund uh, uh, fund balance or un 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 uncompensated leave balance. Mm -hmm. It's about a million bucks. Is that correct? Uh, one point three. One point three million. Is there a better way to do that? I know we all, we look at like a quarter million. You know, th th you get a feel for who's going to leave and who's going to stay. Uh, yeah. Is there a better way to manage that, or is this how other towns do it? I would say you're pretty typical. Um, what you need to make sure you're doing, and generally most communities do this within their personnel policies is there's a notification window which would allow the finance office and give them notification that these people are retiring and we're going to have to liquidate these liabilities and it allows them time to work that into the budget and that current portion um, either there's a, a standing target that you're budgeting each year or it's based upon a known amount because to receive your payment you need to notify us of your intention to retire by this date mm -hmm. um, as far as what Hampton's doing, I would say, you are beginning to fund the liability. Uh, a lot of communities have not. Um, this is a liability you can fund through an expendable trust fund, which the town has started to do to, again, have um, a fund to offset this to limit the budgetary impact that a major retirement may have or a separation may have on the town that the money is set aside in the trust fund and the board typically as agents can uh, vote to withdraw that money um, that was previously appropriated and set aside um, to limit future budgetary impacts. So kind of pay now so you don't have to, you can stabilize the tax rate as you move forward. Thank you, Scott. On page number 21, and we're, we're getting through this, pardon me, but I, I think this is uh, the most important document that uh, we review every year, uh, right up there with the budget. Uh, would you please explain as a matter of uh, capital assets, uh, the depreciation schedule for years, um, and your thresholds for um, for values, mm -hmm. um, values on the top, and then uh, that depreciation schedule and the implications uh, for that hundred million essentially, and what that looks like for uh, an expenditure for leadership and citizens and taxpayers. Sure. Um, basically, the the town has a policy, and um, it sets a, a threshold or a criteria. It names essentially in accordance with GASB 34 what you consider a capital asset and. Um, all land is considered a capital asset. Buildings um, or improvements in excess of $10,000. Machinery and equipment have a $5,000 threshold. Uh, heavy equipment is $25,000. Vehicles are $10,000. Your infrastructure has $150,000. So that's the framework um, or the, the template criteria that the finance office is using to identify what is considered a current year expense versus a capital item that we're throwing on our asset listing. Um, again, if you were to look at your capital asset listing versus an asset listing for insurance, there might be more things on insurance, but these are the major the major items. Um, the depreciation range down below, um, those are kind of a useful lifespan. So buildings and improvements, they range between 10 years and 50 years, depending on management's estimate of the useful life of that building. Um, Machinery and equipment obviously is much lower, three to 25, inf infrastructure 25 to 50. So basically, there's significant capital outlays. There are significant, ju there's significant judgment involved in trying to determine what the useful life is. But the whole, the whole goal is, is, is to match the useful life with the economic value of the asset so that you're, you're taking a, it's a straight line depreciation. So you take the same amount each year, but you're, you're trying to time that, um, that useful life with the actual economic reality or economic life of that asset and taking that expense each year. Got it, Scott. And, and um, it's, it's fair to say that if you've started out with $100 million, whether you pay it, uh, that, that expense that you identify, whether you replace it, repair it, uh, rebuild it, get a new one, uh, that adds up. And if you don't do anything, eventually you get hit with that bill when it crumbles or like our pipes out here, they're no good anymore or a wastewater treatment plan. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's 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 this concept here and then there's your, your capital planning that if you have a 100-year-old sewer system, um, you're going to need to either... Uh, budget for a major repair uh, that's going to sustain the system over a number of years or you're going to fix it as it breaks and maybe some years you win some years you lose but there's going to be a cost of maintaining infrastructure regardless right uh thank you scott and we've got different uh, fund balance classifications um could you just briefly explain those please on page sure. number 22. Yeah. um <clears throat> non-spendable um again mainly are prepaid um, items, inventory items, um, 
restricted are amounts that are restricted from an external source. Maybe it's a grant or a contribution that comes with some strings attached. Um, that money is restricted. Committed is something that has been restricted by an act of the governing body by um, an annual meeting, say there's a special warrant article um, that's appropriating money for a specific purpose. That balance would be committed until either expended or, or lapsed. Um, assigned is something that has been designated by management as um, a use of fund balance. Typically this is most significantly your encumbrances, some other items, but these are items that don't necessarily have the, the formal governing body level of restriction but have been identified as not available or unassigned and then your unassigned is what's what's left over and truly free and available to to spend or to appropriate towards reducing taxes in the next year. Great. Thank you, Scott. And I, I don't look for an answer, but it, it conceptually, I know that you have a contract for services with the town. We've got uh, these extraordinary uh, depreciation items. We've got these uh, um, essentially unfunded liabilities to the state for uh, 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 34, Gatsby 34. Um, we've got that unassigned fund balance. We've got uh, exigent uh, infrastructure needs that are coming up for Warren articles. And I would be interested um, in uh, uh, your opinions on um, what a priority Priorities, what those uh, um, bond amounts look like uh, in that kind of service for the town. And I, and I don't speak for, for the board, um, but I think there's a, a value added to, for example, we, we voted here a couple of weeks ago on the um, uh, unassigned fund balance. We, we, we rolled over, if you will, $600,000. And uh, if we could get a uh, more professional uh, uh, input onto that, I think that's instructive uh, from somebody that's in the science of finance. Uh, and we don't get that. And uh, the year before was one million, I think, in this report. It was one million and change. Then we go to 600, and uh, we just kind of will split the difference. We did that. Um, I stand by that, but I, I think we can get a better professional uh, recommendation from you that, that backs up the science of finances. And I don't need an answer for that, but uh, um, I think that's an important consideration. Pardon me while I just review as I, as I push through this. Um, page number 27, uh, allowance for uncollectibles. We are looking at uh, $0.4 million. Can you explain the uh, uh, nitty-gritty on that, if you will? That is uh, 8000 bucks a week that we're not collecting. Um, what's the deal? You're smiling. No, uh, yes. Yeah, so that that is an estimate. I just want to take a look here at, sure. at the fund. Um, Again, I'm, I, I don't have the detail in front of me, but I believe the, the majority of that is going to be related to your emergency medical fund. Got it. Um, and amounts that have not been collected for ambulance services. Um, this is something that hits a community like Hampton particularly hard uh, because of everything, all the recreation that you have going on and the proximity of the beach that it places a strain on your uh, medical response. And these are essentially... Um, amounts that would need to be collected, but um, ambulance services typically have poor collection rates across the board. Sure. Um, so this is a, a net amount or an estimate of of uh, probably some older receivables that the town's having trouble collecting. Got it. And, and again, I would point to the beach, and if we're running 20, 25 points of uh, percentage for service on that on 400 grand, that's eighty thousand dollars, which is another unreimbursed expense um, at the state level. And I think that's. Uh, hugely problematic. Um, page 29 are uh, long-term bonds. Again, we've got uh, uh, a substantial amount of warrants coming up this year. I'd be looking for uh, an evaluation on that. Um, perhaps if the board would agree and you uh, enlarge your scope of services and uh, get with finance and the town manager um, to uh, look at that. We've got um, maturity dates going out to t uh, 2034. Um, and it just gives us a better management tool. We're running first responder services, uh, we're responsive to citizens, myriad operations, and we get that scientific interpretation on designated fund balance, uh, our uh, depreciation, and then these bond schedules and what's coming off. And it's, sometimes it's hard, uh, I know it's hard for me, and I study it, um, to, to put all that math together and evaluate uh, future needs. Uh, and, and some that are, are today crumbling and they, uh, 
they're hugely problematic. Um, interest uh, on page 30, it's uh, 4.3 million dollars on our on our bonds. Correct. Um, any solution to that? Uh, I know the interest rates are low. It's a good deal, but uh, uh, another expensive doing business. Um, any solutions on that? Any comments? Uh, again, it's looking at the totality of it. Um, some communities heavily fund trust funds to limit the amount of borrowing, limit the interest expense. It requires kind of an annual appropriation to to cover some of these needs, so you can take the money from yourself. Um, but again. It has a short run impact of if you're going to put five hundred thousand dollars into some type of capital improvement fund that goes to the taxpayers that year and they're going to have to pay for that in their tax bill versus waiting until you need to bond but again you're going to pay that with with interest um, rates are low right now they haven't always been low um, you know there have been some refundings and refinancings that um, on bonds that are eligible to take advantage of the lower interest rates but um, again, the, I guess the the conceptual solution to that is the more you put away in a in a capital reserve expendable trust type situation, it allows you to you know potentially reduce the amount you have to borrow going forward. But either way, money needs to be appropriated to to pay for it. Um, obviously, if you go the bond route, you're going to be appropriating interest and principal, so there's going to be a cost to borrowing. Got it. Thank you, Scott. Page 31, again, back to that, uh, that uh, great benefit we offer um, employees of the town. Um, at December 31, 2016, there's a $23.5 million liability for pensions. And I know there's a, a wiggle room in that based on they're, they're assuming a 7.25. I think that's too high. However, there is a, a significant shortage in that fund. And I would say that uh, for the year ended, 2016, uh, the town recognized the pension expense, and it's pretty. It's going to be pretty much around, <coughs> of three million dollars, and that is over 10 percent of our operating budget. Right, and, and 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 that's just a point to bring up with all of this too, as opposed to your bonds where there's an amortization schedule or repayment amount. Um, the net pension doesn't work like that. You have to your current rates that you're paying now for your police, your firefighter, your regular employees, those are both paying the expected benefits of your current employees, and there's a percentage of that rate that is designed to pay down this liability over time. Got it. That's why that number is, is so high. Got it, got it, understand completely. Uh, page number 33, uh, another $4.2 million in OPEB. Explain the uh, reality on the ground for that, please. Sure, and um, this is, other post-employment benefits. So this is essentially the cost of um, having employee, retired employees in your actuarial pool for health insurance. Theory being that even if you don't provide an explicit benefit where the town pays a portion of your benefits for a number of years, that everyone's rate is higher because you have retired individuals who are higher utilizers of health care. Um, therefore driving your, your costs up. The way the standard is now, what that is is they report it net. So that 4.2 million is the, is the accrual amount, if you will. But they say, we're gonna give you credit for the contributions that you pay each year and we're gonna project a liability based upon the net amount. That's flipping over next year and you're gonna get the bigger number. Um, the rules have changed, so it's not gonna be that number, but it's the direction that things are heading and, and that disclosure is heading that these are going to be unfunded liabilities. And, and again, the OPEB, the net pension liability, it's not like your compensated absences where you're writing a check for someone or you have the ability to set aside money. There's no funding requirement for it other than you're, you're kind of paying through rates for all this stuff, but it is a large component of your balance sheet going forward. Got it. Uh, page number 42. Uh, again, when I get back to the state, we've got uh, uh, intergovernmental revenues, <clears throat> if you will. Uh, and specifically the state. The meals and rooms <clears throat> revenue uh, is about what we get from our own trust funds. Uh, there's probably one restaurant in town or one hospitality uh, association that would do the $0.7 million that we receive for the state. Just throwing that out there again about um, imbalances with the state. Uh, and then for a total of $1.3 million, 
Um, and, and of note, uh, there were gentlemen from Portsmouth, there were gentlemen from Portsmouth in here last week, uh, just on two things from the MTBE uh, disbursements of funds, they received $0.4 million inside of that. Uh, and so um, I would, uh, Mr. Welch is uh, doing the eyebrows. Uh, I agree with him. I don't think I need to uh, beat that horse anymore. Um, uh, I'm going to wrap it up. I think that's an extraordinary, extraordinary document, and it is getting tighter and tighter all the time. Uh, I would uh, applaud finance and the finance director, um, her leadership and Mr. Welch's leadership, and you guys do a great job, and I would be interested um, to, to begin a discussion about some other scopes of service in terms of uh, these extraordinary depreciation amounts, uh, these extraordinary Warren articles are going to hit us, and in, in perhaps um, expanding your scope of services for a fee to give us some, some good advice on that. Sure, and I can, I can work with Christy to develop a set of agreed-upon procedures. Wonderful. Uh, Scott, thank you so much. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. I have, a, I have a couple of questions. Sure. Number one, on the pension liability yes. going on top of the bonds, mm -hmm. what does that do to our, our bond rating? Maybe you or Christy could... <laughs> It, there, so what I can say, there's not a definite answer to that. Um, it's happened to everyone globally. Um, New Hampshire versus the peers, you have a relatively high percentage because our, our plan is one of the least funded, probably the easiest way to put it. Um, but I do know just in my kind of talkings with some of the, the people in the bond world that I believe that they look at the items separately. Um, Net pension liability, the, those companies understand what it is, and they're more concerned with, you know, your traditional debt than than this liability. Although, again, certainly any liability would be a concern, but I think everyone knows on the finance side the difference between between the two, and it's not just that, you know, you went out and doubled your liabilities in one year. Right. Mm -hmm. And the other, the other question is on on the unfunded uh, or the unassigned fund balance. Mm -hmm. The, a lot of people assume that's a cash balance. That is not, it's right? It's not a cash balance. Right. Um, a lot of that can be tied up in receivables yeah. um, and things that are not in cash. And, and there is a cash balance on that report, but it's not your unassigned fund right. balance. Right. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Approval of minutes.